Welcome to this poetry lesson on Edna St. Vincent Millay's Sonnet 29. A bit difficult to say the poet's name, so luckily you only have to just call her Millay. You don't have to call her by the full name, Edna St. Vincent Millay. If you can get past her difficult name, the poem itself is actually pretty simple and straightforward. So it's not a hard poem and it's very kind of pure and as most sonnets are really, it's just got one idea to it, one central idea. So the name is difficult, but the poem is not too hard. So it's not gonna to be too much of a difficult lesson for you guys, hopefully. And I'll guide you through it as always. So the first thing with this poem is I'm gonna read it aloud for you. It's not copyright, so I can, I can do that. And I want you to just think about the imagery that is explored and think about what that central idea might be. So what is it that she's trying to express? So I'll read it for you now. Pity me not because the light of day at close of day no longer walks the sky. Pity me not for beauties passed away from field to thicket as the years go by. Pity me not the waning of the moon nor that the ebbing tide goes out to sea nor that a man's desire is hushed so soon, and you no longer look with love on me. This I have known always, love is no more than the wide blossom which the wind assails, than the great tide that treads the shifting shore, strewing fresh wreckage gathered in the gales. Pity me that the heart is slow to learn, when the swift mind beholds at every turn. So whether this is your first time to the poem or you've tried studying it on your own and you're kind of coming here for extra help, should be some things that are immediately apparent to you. So you should be able to kind of pick up on the basic images and some of the ideas. You'll notice that it's repeating this word pity. One thing that's important with that is it says pity me not quite a few times and then it ends with pity me. So there's a shift here in the tone. Instead of saying, don't pity me for these things, it ends by saying, pity me, that the heart is slow to learn. So pity my heart, feel sorry for my heart. Because my mind is faster, the swift mind catches up, but the heart is slow. So that's kind of the main ending of the poem, as we'll see in a minute. So I have some vocab here. Feel free to pause and look through that vocab if you need. I kind of just, uh, it's not too difficult, the vocab in this one, so I'm not going to go spend a lot of time on it, but there might be a few words that you're confused by, so feel free to just pause and have a look there. And we're going to jump straight in to the story summary. So with the story of this, all sonnets have a speaker and most of them have an addressee. So a speaker is the person who's speaking the voice of the poem. It's not always the poet themselves. Quite often the speaker is a persona, it's a character. So when you're dealing with this type of poem, a sonnet, you, you don't wanna say that it's the poet herself. You wanna say the speaker of the poem because she might be speaking in character or she might only be revealing part of herself, not just being like, you know, I'm the poet, this is what I say. Because usually in poetry, everyone's kind of exploring different aspects to their personalities rather than just being fully themselves. So the addressee is the person who is being spoken to and the speaker asks the addressee or actually even commands, she uses an imperative verb, pity me not. Um, so she commands the addressee, the poem that the, uh, the person, the poem is addressed to, to not feel sorry when sunlight leaves the sky, or that beauties pass. When she talks about beauties, it's quite abstract, so it could be her own beauty, like she's becoming older possibly and her beauty's fading, which is not something that everyone agrees on, but um, you know, quite a, a sort of standard attitude to beauty, that people are more beautiful when they're younger. Or maybe things that she had that were beautiful in her life that are now gone. And then she says, the things that were beautiful have passed from the field where you would see them. So a field is like an open piece of grass to a thicket, which is like a hedge. 
So they've gone from being out in the open to being hidden. She doesn't want the reader to feel sorry for her because the moon is waning. So a waning moon is when it's kind of going away in the sky, it's starting to disappear. Or because the tide is flowing out. And then she switches from talking about nature and saying that all these natural things happen to talking about her own personal human imagery. And she says that you shouldn't feel sorry for her because men stop loving too quickly and you stop loving her. So we realize at this point, halfway through the poem, which is an important structural point, that it's not actually a general audience, it's a specific person who she's addressing this poem to, and it's uh, presumably the man that stopped loving her. So it's the first time we realize that the poem is addressed to a previous partner or lover. So the, the speaker says she's always known that love is nothing more than flower blossom being attacked by the wind. The sea tide that touches the beach, which brings up litter and destroyed objects. She asks the addressee to pity her only because her heart is too slow to catch up and process, even though her mind is quick to adapt and move on. So the general message of this poem is that all these natural things happen in life and this is how nature works and this is how love works and love and humans are part of nature. So we shouldn't really feel sorry for these things happening, you know, men moving on from loving the woman they were with. The only thing that is sad or tragic is this second to last line where the heart is too slow to catch up, to process what's happened, to move on. That's the only tragedy in this expression of love. So sonnets typically as a form, as we'll see, are always about love and they explore different angles. So she might have written other sonnets that are more positive about love. So she's, you don't want to say that she's really negative all the time about love. But you'd say that this poem is slightly critical of love. It's kind of saying it it's going to disappear over time and that's just granted and that's something natural and we shouldn't expect it to be otherwise. And the only thing that's difficult is that hearts don't mend quick enough and they don't move on quick enough. So hopefully you've got a handle on what she's saying. Hopefully you've not experienced this yourself because it's kind of like a sad attitude to love. Some of us probably have, I think I probably have in my life, but yeah, hopefully you're reading, you're watching this lesson, you're like, oh, love's not like this, it's all beautiful and great. Um, yeah, so we'll go a bit more into the speaker and voice now, now that I've given you my backstory. Um, yeah, so the speaker's a female and she's speaking to a male. So in this case, we have a female versus a male persona. And the male persona is silent, he's just being spoken to. The female is the one that is doing the speaking, so she's speaking from her point of view, her perspective. And she speaks directly to her partner or lover, her past. We don't know much about their relationship, like how long it lasted, what kind of relationship it was, was it marriage, was it a fling, that kind of thing. So it doesn't seem to matter to her because she's just exploring the theme of love, the topic of love. So it's not so much personal as it is about the idea of love itself. And she has a shift in tone, which is really important. If you can find shifts in tone in literature, that is always a high level thing to be able to talk about. So it's always good to focus on that. So she goes from being defiant, quite strong, willed, strong minded, very sure of herself in the beginning, when she says, don't feel sorry for me about all these natural things to a little bit soft at the end. Do feel sorry for me about my heart. It's too slow to catch up, to move on. So it's more poignant, poignant meaning kind of sad, beautiful, sort of tugging at your heartstrings kind of feeling. So it kind of goes from inner strength to weakness. Like she starts strong and she's sure she's gonna write this poem that's really defiant about love and, you know, and she's really independent and strong and so on. And she's like, oh, it's just natural and we all move on. So she's taking this very like strong position at the beginning on love. And by the end, she's a bit softer and weaker. And we realize that even though her mind is completely logically moved on from this situation, 
something about her heart is still in that place and finding it hard to recover. So it, it ends up being a softer and more complex poem than it starts out to be, which I quite like about it. Um, so attitudes now, if you want to do a task on this poem, I recommend finding attitudes. This is a good thing to do with all poems, really. An attitude is like an opinion about something. So what are the opinions? I've found some attitudes here, but feel free to pause and have a look yourself if you have time. If you don't, I'm going to just move on and tell you my attitudes that I found. So I found four attitudes relating to four, four different quotations. The first one, and you no longer look with love on me. The woman is quite defensive in her attitude here. Her opin opinion is defensive. It's like, you don't love me. It doesn't, it's not double-sided. It's not they don't love each other. They've fallen out of love. It seems like the woman really stayed faithful to the man and the man is the one that changed and decided not to love anymore. So it's almost accusatory. It's almost as if she's accusing him in this short sentence. You can analyze it further. You can see how there's like L repeated there. So we have a alliteration and so on. Pity me that the heart is slow to learn. It suggests that the woman wants the man to understand she doesn't know how to recover. So the only thing that he should really help her with or give her time for or feel sorry for her about is that her heart is slow to catch up, as I said before. So she's finding it hard for her emotions. The heart is a sort of symbol that we use in literature to represent um, your soul or your feelings, your emotions, that kind of sensitive side of yourself rather than the mind, which is the logical, practical side. So she's saying, my mind's completely in the right place and I totally understand. I don't feel. So there's a difference between your mind and your heart in that sense. I don't feel like I've recovered. So yeah, with this mind, it's logical. And with the heart, it's emotional. And there's a disconnection between those two in terms of her attitude to her previous lover. Finally, there's kind of clear attitudes on nature. So light of day fades into night, beauty disappears over time, the moon wanes, the tide ebbs. Ebbing is where it goes out, waning is where the moon day by day slowly disappears until there's no moon in the sky. So these natural processes, as things grow and move forwards, they also fade and disappear. And that is a very natural kind of transition, a natural process in the world around us. So she believes that relationships and uh, human interaction is the same because she's sort of saying all of nature functions on these mechanisms. Good, so hopefully you found similar attitudes. If you found different ones, there are loads of attitudes there. So, um, you know, it's good if you found separate ones from mine. And hopefully you're feeling quite confident with the ideas of this poem by this point in the lesson. So again, you're welcome to do that with language features. Find your own first if, if you have time. The benefit of doing that kind of thing is it just like gives you a bit of your own time and space to think about the poem first before I tell you what my opinion is. So then you have a bit more data, a bit more information. But if you don't have time, we'll move on to a few language features. So the first one is anaphora. Pity me not, pity me not, pity me not, pity me. You'll notice that it repeats loads, but it, it goes from a, a negative phrasing to a positive phrasing there. Um, conversely from what she's trying to prove, so the opposite from what she's saying, which is, oh, I've moved on, I'm fine. She's repeating this so much, it might suggest obsession over the relationship or obsession or fixation on the idea of this, this lost or broken love. It might indicate that her brain is trying to give her lots of different reasons about why she should accept it and move on. So sort of like her mind is kind of fighting her heart and it's trying to just be like, well, there's this and this and this. And that's why she's giving all of these different natural examples of how things grow and then fade. 
eventually the phrase becomes positive, as I said. And that suggests perhaps that she has finally, by the end of the poem, let her emotions overcome her, that the, no matter how many reasons the mind comes up with, the emotions win in the end. So the visual imagery you should have kind of developed a sensitivity for already because we looked at that right at the beginning. Mainly it's natural imagery, so it's a way to describe love as a natural process by observing nature and how it works and trying to compare that to the way that love works. So the word comparison is important that she's making a comparison. Alliteration, there's a lot of this. And um, I've given a detailed example of one analysis of alliteration if you're interested in that. So feel free to have a look at that in the notes at the end of the lesson. Metaphor is quite important, which is why I think probably why I, I colored it slightly differently. Maybe that was just an accident, I don't know. I just realized it's like a different font and different color. But basically the metaphor is or well, metaphor is kind of a thing that she's using all the time. So almost every visual image is a different metaphor about love because of this comparison thing. And that is a very high level point to make in an essay about this poem. So as she comes up with a new image, that image is also becoming a metaphor about love because the process of love is natural. So she's like, it happens like this in, in the sea or it happens like this in the moon and that's how it happens with love as well. It swells and then it flows out again, it disappears. So it suggests that love is cyclical, that it goes up and down. And she suggests that a man's love for a woman always ends, which I think is a little unfair, personally. I think it's like equal both ways, in my opinion. So I think sometimes women you know, can go off the man, men can go off the women. If you have relationships that are both male or female, that can also disrupt. So I don't think it really matters what gender, um, what gender is kind of like doing the loving versus the, the waning, the disappearing of the love. But I do think that it does happen in relationships. It's an interesting aspect of love to explore. And in a way, it's a bit more realistic and more um, more subtle, like more complex than just being like, love is beautiful and perfect and so on. So even though sonnets are about love, she's not just exploring like the nice bits about love. She's trying to think about more difficult stuff to do with love, harder stuff, maybe painful stuff, as well as the like nice bits of it. Um, the waning of the moon, this was more symbolism. I didn't actually write that in there, did I? I can sort of write that now. <laughs> so symbolism, the moon is often used as a symbol for kind of romance because um, basically like, I don't know, in literature generally people meet at moonlight or it's kind of like a, a beautiful time of day where moonlight kind of makes things look pretty and silvery. It's quite sensual and romantic. So the idea of moonlight fading, the moon waning, slowly disappearing, suggests that this, this period of romance is over. Um, so it's quite a nice symbol there as well. So structure then, we've got a few, um, a few points here. I'm gonna actually just bold the, um, bold in the bits that are, technically a structure or form point just so that when you use those in your essays you know what these things you know you know that this is like a term like a structural term basically um yeah so the first one it's a traditional shakespearean sonnet so this is a type of sonnet invented by shakespeare feel free to look into the specifics of the rhyme scheme and how that is shakespearean if you want the main thing with a shakespearean sonnet is that um, there's a tormented lover. So when Shakespeare writes his sonnets, it's always from the point of view of someone who's had a bad experience with love. And obviously you can see that it, it, uh, the speaker takes the position of the tormented lover in this uh, sonnet. There's someone who's not had a good experience with love. And then the first stanza begins with rational 
feelings, logical emotions. It begins with the mind. And then it shifts. Um, finally, there is a kind of descent into emotions and feelings. So a transition here from the mind to the heart, from logical, rational processes to emotional processes. And if you want to analyze that along stereotypes as well, female stereotypes are typically emotional and feeling based and masculine stereotypes are typically rational and logical. So it's kind of like, in a way, Millet saying, you know, I'm giving into my more feminine aspects of myself, the emotions and the feelings that I'm in touch with. And, um, you know, I can't just uphold the masculine aspects, the logical, clear, rational aspects forever. So that's an interesting interpretation as well, if you want to do it on what we associate typically with masculinity versus what we associate typically with femininity and how those are present in this poem. So, um, tiny bit of context here. Depending on your exam board, you may or may not need context, so double check that if you're uh, studying this for a particular reason, rather than just, you just follow my lessons. I know, I, I really hope there are just people out there that like poems and follow these lessons, but I, I assume most of you have a reason, <laughs> you know, just like a poetry fangirl like me. Um, I do, I mainly do it because it's really fun, and also I like teaching, but yeah, I enjoy d dissecting poems. Um, yeah, so. Millet lived from 1892 to 1950. So we call her a modernist writer. Modernism is maybe my favorite period of literature. It's a really, really good period. So if you're interested in different movements in literature and you know how literature progresses over time, that kind of thing, definitely get into modernism. Really interesting time period. Um, so yeah, during modernist time, which is kind of probably from like 1900 until maybe 1940, 1950. Poets are really exploratory and experimental and they're trying to explore new ideas and emotions. And we can see this here because she's not just like, oh, I'm gonna write yet another poem about love. I'm gonna actually try and write something personal and different and difficult maybe and subtle and really, um, confusing <laughs> like it's almost like she doesn't know or the speaker doesn't know her own how she's supposed to be so she's sort of trying to explore it in a poem but she doesn't really come to a conclusion about it it doesn't help necessarily so it's an examination of a tormented lover's psyche the examination of what a mind goes through if it's in this state of um what we call unrequited love so unrequited means um basically like it's not giving back in some way sometimes it's called unrequited so i'm gonna actually i'll just write the word so that you know what i'm on about this is a really good um word to talk about if you ever have something dealing with the theme of love and it's not equal like one person loves the other one more one rejects the other that kind of thing uh, so yeah it's a specific type of love and it's um quite a good literary term as well so it's just a good a good word to know basically um, yeah, so she's famous for sonnets and the St. Vincent Millay. When I was studying literature at uni, my uh, best friend at, at uni was obsessed with Millay, so she's always telling me to read her, and I never did because I was really like busy with my own stuff. And um, yeah, but now actually teaching her, I really like her. But she, she does sonnets, so she's a, you could call her a sonneteer sometimes. Um, I'll, I'll give you that word as well, sonneteer. Oh, I don't know if it's spelled that way. Hang on. <laughs> there. She's a sonneteer. That's someone who's a poet, but specifically someone who writes sonnets. So that suggests she writes lots of different types of sonnets, exploring different parts of love. So she's not personally had this terrible relationship necessarily. She's just looking at it from one angle. So this is quite important here. It's not her opinions directly in the poem. She's taking on a persona. She's becoming a character to explore certain emotions and certain ways that we can feel as humans, certain experiences that we can have. So you don't want to be too personal about it and be like, oh, Millet had a terrible relationship and this nasty man came along and, you know, 
abandoned her and then she felt bad because it's it's a lot more complex than that she's putting on a character she's not just um personal and the reason i know this in case you're just like how do you know which to be honest if i was in your position i would be the same the reason i know this is because i looked it up and she did have a difficult life before 1923 but in 1923 she married a rich man she fell in love she had a perfect time in this year this year everything changed for her she got enough money to devote her life to her writing her poetry then became successful she remained happily married with this man so the poem is saying love always fades but then you know her real her reality her life and her relationship that didn't happen so it shows you it's not personal it's her taking on the role of a you know the purpose of a sonneteer is to explore different things you can do with a sonnet and a sonnet is always a poem about love so she's just looking at it from this angle from this perspective so finally then we have some themes themes are really big ideas that are explored in, in literature so make sure that you know what themes are and you're happy to talk about them because you can't really get a high grade on an essay without being confident with your themes so the first three we have nature um, and it's natural to disappear as it is natural to grow. We have cycles and nature works in cycles. So this is a justification for why the love between the speaker and addressee faded over time. But there is some tension and resistance. So even though she's concocted this really grand argument of, you know, it all happens in nature and if we observe it, we see it time and time again in all these different processes. There is still some resistance in her own, uh, you know, the speaker's own character to this idea, like she doesn't quite want it to be true or she hopes it's not or she can't 100% come to terms with it and accept it. Beauty is an interesting theme, so you might want to spend time thinking about how this relates to the poem in more detail, but essentially, it's sort of to do with fading beauty and um, the way that beauty fading is natural. So then maybe the man losing interest is natural too. So she's kind of equating beauty with interest from the male attention, which is an interesting thing to explore in a poem and quite a mature, sophisticated thing that you could go into if you were aiming for those higher levels. Um, it's, it's to do with tragic uh, the sort of tragic aspect to love and relationships, like the speaker is kind of an object, she's expected to be beautiful, and the man is the um, kind of active partner in the relationship. It's his choice whether to accept her as beautiful or move on because she's getting old or whatever. So um, you can link it to this context point as well. Women felt a lot of pressure to stay beautiful, to be beautiful. I think. They always do. Um, what's interesting is I think in, in modern times, men actually feel this a lot more as well, just the kind of culture we have with, um, you know, photos and videos being so important to our lives, which is really helpful for me, obviously, as, a, as an online teacher. But um, yeah, so a side effect of that is we're all a bit more conscious of how we look because we've constantly got images of ourselves. So perhaps you can personally relate to that aspect of it. And it is good to always try and personally connect to something as well with poems rather than just uh, not really understanding like the not feeling the emotions that they explore the so last few then emotions again we looked at this kind of changing emotions the difference between heart and mind and the heart representing the emotions relationships so a, quite a complex relationship between the speaker and addressee it's completely one-sided. We only see her side of it. It might be that she's just projected all of this onto him and that that's not the reason he left at all. So we, we don't know his side. We just see it from her perspective. We admire the speaker's kind of um, strength. She's trying to let go of these negative feelings. She's not bitter or angry or regretful or sad necessarily. She's just taking some time to change. So I think that's quite... It's quite motivating. It's not necessarily a negative poem. It's just like, oh, I wish it could happen faster, but I am changing. But 
I'm just adapting slowly kind of thing. Um, there's a lot on love as well. I've kind of given you a few notes there and a lot on psychoanalysis. I didn't really fill out psychoanalysis loads because it's more of like an A level and above thing because it's it's quite complex. But basically it's like if you look at kind of how the brain functions and um, it was a very new discipline in the modernist era. So loads of poets and artists and writers became quite interested in this idea. So definitely delve deeper into that if you're more interested in those ideas. But if you're confused by that word, no need to go into it. So don't worry. Music